Today, here on Bar Talk and Cocktails, we're going to make two completely different drinks. One made with rye and one made with rum. The funny thing about these two drinks is they both share the same name and were served at the same hotel that they were named after. Let's make both of these forgotten cocktails and, well, find out which one tastes better. Located in the heart of Midtown Manhattan, just two blocks from Times Square in New York City, sits an iconic hotel, the Algonquin. It opened its doors on November 22, 1902, where a single room was a whopping $2 a night. The hotel was originally designed as a residential apartment hotel, but had a difficult time selling year-long leases. So it was quickly converted to a traditional hotel having short-term guests making it more profitable. Even the name of the hotel was originally going to be called the Puritan. <laughs> it was Frank Case. He was the, the hotel's first general manager who discovered Algonquin tribes had been the first residents of the area. So the name Algonquin sort of stuck after that. Frank Case took over the lease on the Algonquin Hotel in 1907 and bought the property on which the building sat in 1927 for one million US dollars. Back in 1919, the Algonquin welcomed a group of prominent stage actors, writers, and literary personalities for lunch each day at the hotel. These are people you may or may not have heard of. People like theater critic Alexander Wolcott, playwrights George S. Kaufman, Mark Connolly, and Edna Ferber. Other members of the group included Harpo Marx, Charles MacArthur, uh, Dorothy Parker, Gertrude Stein, Douglas Fairbanks Sr., John Barrymore, and Helen Hayes, just to name a few. There were a lot of members over the years. Though society columns referred to them as the Algonquin Round Table, they called themselves the Vicious Circle, <laughs> mostly because of their razor-sharp wit and caustic, highly critical opinions. These were the people who shared an, a daily exchange of ideas at the hotel every day for 10 years with contributions to literature that would set the literary style of the 1920s. Yeah, times uh, have changed. The table, the wits, and the original bar have long disappeared. When Prohibition ended, Frank Case reopened the bar in the hotel. It was John Barrymore who convinced Case to place blue gels over the lights as he thought people looked more attractive under such lighting. <laughs> How do I look? <laughs> what do you think? Ooh, I'm getting a suntan. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. It was named the Blue Bar and has been part of the hotel ever since. Another bar at the Algonquin was the Oak Room. It was New York City's premier cabaret nightclub when it opened in 1939. A lot of big stars had played the Oak Room over the years. Everyone from Jamie Cullum, Ella Fitzgerald, John Pizzarelli, to uh, Diana Krall and Harry Connick Jr. Actually, some of the careers of these talented musicians were launched at the Algonquin Hotel. And singer Sylvia Sims, she collapsed and died on stage during a performance there in 1992. So much history was made in the Oak Room, but sadly, it was closed for good in 2012. The Algonquin has seen many owners over the years, and today it's owned by Marriott International and is part of Marriott's autograph collection brand. An interesting attraction at the Algonquin is the resident cat that lives there. Actually, the hotel has had many cats living there since 1923. Billy the cat was the first cat in residence that lived in the hotel for 15 years. So one day Billy dies and wouldn't you know it, two days after his death, a stray cat wandered in looking for food. The owner, Frank Case, immediately adopted the cat and named him Rusty. <laughs> then Rusty was renamed Hamlet in honor of the famous classical actor John Barrymore, as Hamlet was probably Barrymore's uh, greatest stage role. And Barrymore uh, just happened to be living at the hotel at the time in the 1930s. Less than two weeks after Frank Case's death, Hamlet was found in the suite, curled beside the bed of his old master. Jaundice and feline leukemia were no doubt the cause of death, but those who knew him said 
He simply died of a broken heart. And so begins the long lineage of cats that live in the hotel. There have been 12 in all. In addition to Billy, the hotel has welcomed seven Hamlets and three Matildas, each of which has been a rescue cat. Hamlet the Eighth is the newest resident at the hotel since August of 2017. He has his own bed and room, his own personal attendant, social media pages, and receives a ton of messages, fan mail, and presents from all over the world. I mean, how much cat, how much catnip can a cat nip? <laughs> no, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I was just wondering what those presents might be. I would, I would imagine they'd be uh, catnip. At the Algonquin, you can order up a very expensive martini. A $10,000 martini on the rock. <laughs> it requires a 72-hour advance notice pre-order and then a visit to the hotel's in-house jeweler. It actually happened back in 2004. A young man popped the question to his girlfriend with the purchase of the first ever $10,000 martini. That was in the blue bar <laughs> under the magic of those blue lights. <laughs> Makes everything look magical. I like this light. Now, this is incredible. New York City's oldest bartender was still working at the Algonquin Hotel when he was 90. <laughs> Hoi Wong, or better known as Mr. Hoi, was a Hong Kong-born American bartender that worked at the hotel for 27 years, from 1979 to 2006. Add the years before he got the gig at the Algonquin, and his total years behind the bar mixing drinks was 58. Whoa, 58 years. I got, a, I got a few years to catch up. I'm only uh, 43 years in. But I'll tell you, it must have been a wonderful experience for him though, you know? Serving martinis to Marilyn Monroe and Judy Garland. He also had the pleasure of serving Joe DiMaggio, Henry Kissinger, Anthony Quinn, and even John Lennon. But his proudest moment came in 1961 when he mixed a drink for the Duke of Windsor, Edward VIII. The Duke ordered a House of Lords martini, in and out on toast. <laughs> now this is funny, the wait captain was prepared to send Wong into the kitchen for a piece of toast. <laughs> but Mr. Hoy knew the Duke wanted a martini with a small amount of dry vermouth swirled around in a mixing glass and then tossed out, in and out. On toast referred to a lemon twist flamed with a match. Hoi Wong passed away on July 30th, 2009, but I betcha he made a few Algonquin cocktails along the way. Something you'd uh, probably never be able to get today if you ordered one. I think maybe all you'd get would be a blank stare from the bartender. <laughs> all right, let's make one, or in this case, two. <laughs> let's make two. <laughs> Under the blue light, yeah. Okay, the first of the two cocktails we're gonna make, I got out of Vintage Spirits and Forgotten Cocktails from uh, Ted Hayes' book there. Now, there's debate whether or not this was uh, before Prohibition or after Prohibition. Um, don't know. <laughs> but I think it's older than the, uh, the other one that we're gonna make. We start with some fresh pineapple. I like fresh pineapple because it's fresh. It tastes better than pineapple from a can. Now, we need three quarters of an ounce. You could muddle and get that, get your juice that way. Or, I think this works marvelous. We'll just use our press, why not? Let's see what we got. Three quarters of an ounce. Yeah, you get a lot of juice this way. Looking good. Fresh pineapple juice. Okay, next thing is some rye. I'm gonna use Sazerac rye today, and we want an ounce and a half. Followed by some uh, dry vermouth, where are you? Oh yeah, I brought it out from the fridge. Three quarters of an ounce. And that's it. Drop some ice in here. pop a lid on and shake it. <laughs> How are we shaking? Shake it like a 
shake it like a coin-operated vibrating hotel bed. <laughs> yeah. Looking good. Get rid of this ice. And fine strain it. Just get rid of those ice shards. Nice. To garnish or not to garnish? That is the question. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking maybe a couple little um, little spears from the uh, from the pineapple. We're just going to set that off to the side right now and make the other drink. So the second uh, Algonquin cocktail. I found out of uh, Dale DeGroff's uh, Craft of the Cocktail. Completely different. I think it was a little later time-wise when they were uh, concocting this one. We need some rum. Today I'm going to use uh, Blackstrap uh, rum uh, from Last Straw Distillery. The folks at Last Straw Distillery really nailed this one. <laughs> They're Ontario's smallest production micro distillery located in Vaughan, Ontario. That's a little north of Toronto. It's a white rum and an unaged rum. What makes this rum unlike many other white rums is that it's full of dark rum flavors. You see, they use blackstrap molasses rather than sweet molasses, which gives a richer, more robust flavor when it's distilled. At 46% ABV or 92 proof, it really has a lot of character. A terrific clean nose full of molasses and a full flavor on the palate, yet still very light and round. Two ounces. Blackberry brandy. Um, closest thing I got to blackberry brandy is Chambord. Um, we could use cassis, but that's, that's black uh, currants. It does have some notes of uh, blackberry brandy. Uh, we want half an ounce. Getting low on that too. <laughs> uh, gotta get some more. Benedictine. <laughs> That's getting low too. Jesus. <laughs> Half an ounce. It seems a little sweeter just by looking at it so far. And uh, some lime juice. Half an ounce fresh pressed lime juice. Come on. That looks about right. Right there. All right. Half an ounce. Drop in some ice. One big cube there. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, there we go. Pop a lid on. <laughs> How are we shaking this time? I'm running out of quarters for that vibrating bed. <laughs> Looking good. Whoa. Completely different. Got another nice little cocktail glass. We're going to get rid of that ice. Just chilling there. Real nice. And we're going to just fine strain it out. Nice. Maybe a little cherry. Looking good. Let's bring in the, the other one. They're almost the same color, aren't they? Isn't that interesting? Okay, let's give this a go. I'm gonna go with the first one. The first Algonquin cocktail. Mm. That's interesting. It's quite dry, actually. The pineapple gives it a little brightness, and the whiskey seems to ground everything together. Very complex. But it seems to um, overwhelm the uh, dry vermouth. Oh, it's there. It's nice. Okay, let's try this one. <laughs> Whoa, completely different. Whoa. Mm. Actually, I thought it was going to be sweeter than it is. This is also quite dry, drier than I expected. The lime, I think, is 
cuts that dryness and also the rum. Yeah, this is a rum cocktail for sure. I get very little Chambord and I get very little Benedictine, believe it or not. I'm getting rum and lime. So your to-do list <laughs> in the very near future is to make them both and let me know which one you like better. I'm kind of swaying towards this one. Actually, let me, let me give this one a go again. Kind of weird because, I don't know, I, I'm a whiskey guy. <laughs> but this one, I don't know, this one, this one seems to have more, uh, more complexity. It's quite nice. Shake it like a hotel, no. uh, shake it like a coin operated hotel bed, shake it like a vibrating hotel vibrating, shake it like a, shake it like a coin up, uh, shake it like a coin operated vibrating hotel bed. Why is that so difficult? Okay, my soliloquy is to Algonquin. Or not to Algonquin? <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> They're both delightful, honestly. And you know, I seem to be all out of quarters right now. <laughs> so why don't you hit the, <laughs> hit the subscribe button, check the other videos out, and I'm gonna go look for some quarters for that uh, vibrating bed. You know? <laughs>